Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Can you hear me? I'm hoping and praying that I see 5x5 five five in the live chat here in just a second. And if I get the green light from you that you can hear me, then I will go ahead and proceed. Hey, John. Okay. That's terrific. Wonderful. Um, let me get on camera here. We'll set the stage for you, but what a relief that you can hear me. And you can see Lydia's title slide, Untangling the Magmas and Timing of a Super Eruption. Okay. You guys can keep chatting. They can't hear you. We're good. We're good. Guys, just don't fight. Don't fight. But fight. Get the fighting out now before this camera swings around on you. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us live. Many of you are joining us. We have 68 and more are, are, are streaming in. No pun intended. But uh, uh, if you're watching this in replay, and that's most of you, uh, it's 11.44 a.m. Pacific time on a Friday, and we're going to start this lecture in 15 minutes, essentially. So in replay form, you can go ahead and skip ahead 15 minutes. I'm just going to say hi to a few folks. We're going to test the, uh, the microphone with Lydia, uh, visiting with Hannah Shamlu here, and uh, we'll give you a chance to see the room. But We've got uh, people enjoying our uh, treats outside and coffee and everything else. So where are you viewing from? It's been a while since we've done this. It took me a long time to remember how to set this whole thing up, but I'm, I'm thrilled that we're working here. So let's go. Brian's grabbing a smoke before we start. Good to know that, Brian. So Paul's in Glasgow, Scotland, Springfield, Oregon, Carthage, North Carolina, South Wales, UK, San Clemente, California. There's Don. He's back in Los Angeles. Hi, Don. You made the trip all the way up here driving to the downtown lectures. Barcelona, Spain, Denmark. Oh, I'm starting to get emotional here to see all these distant places. Oh, my God. Oh, okay. Keep it together, boy. Keep it together. It's been a while since we've done this. It, it is magical. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, States, I'm back away. Statesboro, Georgia, Laconer, Washington, uh, Deering, Kansas, Tri Cities, Washington, Lovely Ballard, Pocatello, Idaho. Dick is in the Netherlands, Woodland, Washington, Penticton, British Columbia. And if you're new to us and you're waiting to start to see this lecture, you're like, get on with it. Start introducing the speaker. That's not how this works. This is a live stream. And now we're up to 130 people. And uh, uh, before I forget, I've been meaning to say this, that with these Talk Fridays, and this is we've been doing this all school year, so this is not the first time we've done this. Um, you're like, why would, I, why would I view live if I can't interact with the speaker or anything? You know, in these other live streams, there's been plenty of question and answer and that sort of thing. Well, you know, I think, if you've seen these before, that the format is uh, the speaker is working with people in the room. But um, I want to make a point with you right now that I would like to ask some of your questions to our speaker during the question and answer. So don't be bashful about hitting your caps lock asking a question and I'm monitoring uh, the, the live stream as I switch cameras and everything. And I'll do my best to relay your question. I don't know if that's been clear before, but you are welcome to be part of the question and answer is what I'm trying to say if you are with us live. Uh, Letha Lee, uh, her hot cocoa and root beer is still warm. Good to know. Uh, Lancaster, California, the villages, Florida, Keezer, Oregon, backcountry Gary's with us. Hello, Gary. Um, a few more locations, and then we will, uh, yeah, we're, I was so antsy. I just wanted to make sure I was going to have I, this. You don't need to hear it again, but, uh, yeah, our speaker is from Arizona State University, and she flew up yesterday. Uh, Geneva is in Cologne, Germany, and Edinburgh, Scotland, hello, from the United States. Central Texas, the Dolomites in Italy, I'm a, whether you're making it up or not, it's just great to see. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I believe you. If you say you're from England, like Steve, I believe you. Uh, you can't make, Steve, you can't make up Blair come anyway, can you? Jim's in Chehalis, Washington, Norfolk, Virginia, 
Uh, Mark reports that the Garrett, the Dutch night owl from the Netherlands is in Nanaimo, British Columbia. I think that was the plan. He's visiting Jerome Lessman. And Jerome will be here next week to give a talk. Kent Washington. Uh, Help Ma 26 is not sleeping, uh, sleeping in Abu Dhabi tonight. Hello from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. To you in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> It was really crazy. Mexico City. God, jeez. Okay, well, we're approaching uh, 10 minutes before the top of the hour. If you just joined us, our lecture is beginning in about 11 minutes from now. And if you're watching live, I guess you'll have to just be with us another few minutes. But I'll swing you around. We've got mostly an empty room. I don't know why. I guess people are having a good time outside uh, visiting. Uh, but we've we've got the regulars here, so let's let's see if we're functioning with uh, Lydia's mic. Okay, we're going to turn you on now. Don't say anything. We were just going to go in. Leave. No, this is fine. <laughs> so, how was your flight? My flight was great. Okay. You got in a reasonable hour. Got Did in. you rent a car? Or? No, I took the shuttle. Took the so I took the shuttle from SeaTac to Ellensburg, and then Hannah picked me up. Starbucks. 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 Okay. It was she's easy. a super easy guest, too. She's, I can tell. She's, like, she's, she's comfortable. She's low-key. It's, it's easy. Yeah. Very appreciative. That's why I get invited on field trips. Is like, <laughs> can you sleep on the ground? I can, whatever. Yeah, Am I going to be in the field? Sure. <laughs> and will I be fed? Okay. All right. Um, Sign me up. Food, food and fun. <laughs> All right. Well, you are... Functioning. Mic'd and working. Yeah. Great. So we're good. And I'll just keep it on. So hope you know. So careful with what I say. Got keep, it. Keep so busy. don't reveal the nation's secrets. Got it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's written down in, 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 the, in the front desk. So we'll pull that out for okay. you. Yeah. So, so you invited Lydia to speak yes. before you met her in New Zealand. That's correct. I saw Lydia give a Zoom talk, maybe 2021. Yeah, mid pandemic. I, I was like, it just kind of held it in my head. I'm like, mm -hmm. she's awesome. Mm -hmm. She's very energetic and mm -hmm. smart. And then I met her at a conference in New Zealand. And yeah, here I am. I knew I made a good choice. Yeah, but I did accept before she actually met me in person. Yes. So you were taking yes. a little bit of a gamble. <laughs> so. True. Yeah, what if you okay. met her in New Zealand? And she was like, the oh. worst. Yeah. <laughs> then I don't think you would have invited <laughs> no, would me to stay at your like, house. Yeah, I'd be like, oh, <laughs> and I'd be like, all right, you're, you're going to stay here. Six, yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you're actually camping in the backyard. Yeah, you said you'd come, so. <laughs> yeah, we got you in the Motel 6. Don't worry about it. Okay, thank you for the report. Looks like both mics are working. Yeah. I'll try not to Yeah, it looks like pie, but it's it's just cables. as well, yeah. visiting with Hannah and others. I'm going to go outside and wrestle some people in, but let's uh, let's turn turn you around and get the uh, the dynamic uh, row on camera. Thank you, thank you for. Work any observatories? <laughs> oh yeah, but thank you for joining us. <laughs> uh, but no, probably not. Okay, <laughs> think, Bryce, uh, get your hair ready. Get those, get that, get those cookie crumbs off your sweatshirt. I need to not uh, close this next to the microphone. So yeah. I'll do that. I won't be mm -hmm. tempted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just whoever's talking. It's <laughs> <laughs> what you do in your spare time to stand. We got to crop in. <laughs> John. Alone. No yeah. Talks, so I'm just here. <laughs> like, well, I love this room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that one looks fabulous. <laughs> Jordan lectures in this room, which I think is really cool. I've never taught a class. You okay being on camera? Yeah, just because you've taught smaller classes. Yeah. yeah. Thumbs up. Okay, well, it, i got to get your left ear in there, Chandler. There we go. Chandler the van driver. It's a nice size. That's great. Because they're saying that. I am losing it, Mark. 15, 20 grad students. Yeah, that sounds yeah. right. That's yeah, great. Our cohort, our incoming cohort was six. It's kind of small. Hey, you don't have to take roll or anything. Who's doing that? That's still a great program? number as well. That's and like perfect. with two to three year turnover, oh. like it's yeah, like it's nice one. to keep the department moving. Hey, Davey. Told everyone's excited. So yeah, it's fun. So I'm actually co team teaching uh, geology of the Pacific Northwest class with Chris Manson. Mm -hmm. You're going to meet later. Is he here? He I don't not know. yet. Okay. He was up there. Okay, I missed him. He, yeah. Usually teaches it with Lisa, but she's going on sabbatical, so mm. I'm stepping in. Cool. So I'll, I'll be, be fine. learning a lot from him. 
Yeah, it's like <laughs> I get to take hey, a class I'm new as to well. This area, yeah, but sure, yeah, I'll teach a class. Yeah. On it. I feel like it's the best way to do it. It's totally. like co-teach a class, and then you're like, oh, perfect, yeah, I get to learn like, everything. I'll talk about Helen's, but uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> you can do Yellowstone stuff. That's nearish. That's nearish. That's nearby. That's, okay. that's a do within a day's drive or so. Yeah. Something I don't yeah. know. It's part of it. <laughs> Not not really, but not, yeah. really. not, like not at all. <laughs> no, it's distinctly it. different. Cashman, I know her. Yeah. Twenty seventeen, a classic. Lady. Or I know that figure. <laughs> yeah, I know that figure. Yeah. I know her. She doesn't know me. Yeah, I met her once. I don't think she knows me. Yeah, it's okay. She One day we'll very we'll... delightful though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> super nice. Did I tell you we were doing the Tongariro crossing um in after IFC mm -hmm. and with um with like all the Frontiers Abroad students. So there were like 30 students that were like getting across the Tongariro crossing. Oh. It's like excellent, a great day. Stopping for geology along the way. Like we got like all but maybe like two students over it because of like knee problems and oh, stuff. Wow. So like everyone makes it basically. Mm -hmm. And as we're going up, um Kathy Cashman and Joe Dufek are doing the Tongue River Crossing as well. And so we stopped and Just chatted. Happened. Yeah, because well, everyone's, everyone's doing it, right? Baby, and so what was your we, caption we had on to your, stop uh, and like, so we were like sort of Instagram visiting at like this little outcrop and then Kathy Cashman and Joe Dufek walked by like, with some grad students like, and stuff. And, and we were like, I'm the luckiest guy alive. And then no, um, as they went away, like, like, like those that, two though. geologists are some of the most famous What a world we live in. In our field, right? Amen. So cool. And they're like, they're like, who are they? And I was like, Kathy Cashman and Joe Dupac. And they're like, oh wow. And then, and then we caught up to them again because we're like, we're going faster, slower, faster, slower. And so eventually, we see them again. One of the girls, one of the students, goes, Kathy Cashman. And she's like, can you sign my field notebook? It was so sweet. And she was just like, can you? And so yeah, so she, yeah, she did. She drew a little volcano photo says now you have to be a volcanologist cool. like Kathy Cashman and I was like that's Sweetie. that's so cool that's really cool. yeah so like Dang, I yeah people that. are just like fangirling I mean that woman probably has never felt more famous in her life that's as awesome. her like two-week yeah, vacation totally. through New Zealand yeah like everyone stopped her you know everywhere oh, yeah but she was super super nice I, I you know obviously yeah, and yeah and Jim Dupac is also so nice oh he's and so, so nice. yeah so I met those guys at Cider Oh, cool. Have you, have you done this no, I haven't. No, There's it's one this summer. I know. It's, it's, I need to get more work done for my postdoc. Uh, <laughs> so, like, I was like, Otherwise, I'll do one at some point. Um, it won't be this time. Sure. But yeah, that's fair. That's I've fair. heard the awesome, but I just didn't think that I had like a month. Can, we have, can I ask, are we still five by five for yeah, both me and you. Lydia, please? I was like, I'm going to work at Audio. night. No, no, you're not. No. Like, your brain you is going to be. Dinner and yeah. And, you know, yeah, yeah all, all the fun stuff. Thank so, no, I, I haven't done a cider. Thank One day, hopefully. Yeah, you definitely should. It was a blast. Yeah, I was just, yeah, I'm just sort of in the market for like littler, um, like smaller. Um, conferences or smaller workshops and stuff that I could do. Good. Yeah, I think that's cool. There's a workshop on board patrology instructors, too. Oh, really? Cool. Is it through um, MAGT? Yeah. I think. Okay. And that's in August. Yeah. August. Cool. Mm. One thing that I've been thinking of doing is like a, like a structural job, like how to teach structural geology. Do I know these guys? Kind of is it such a, do I know such you? a thing that everybody needs? Liam, and like, right. I don't yeah. do structure, yeah. but I, I love structures. That's so, so cool. Are you I'm taking about Geology it. 304? Is that why you're here? You're just wanting to take some classes. Okay. Right. Everyone needs someone to teach structure. <laughs> everybody needs a structural geologist. I'm sure they do. I'm sure, like, I'm sure they. <laughs> Still make. Where are they? Where though? are they? They don't make them anymore. All right. <laughs> well, good. Liam, yeah. Well, come visit with me. we got to make sure we're taking good classes from fall. Okay? Okay. And you're a young man? Like mineralization for exploration. Just for geology. Oh, I don't know. I think space stuff is a big, is a big, I'm sure that we're now biased because of CC, but I think space is a big thing. But I think hazards is also like a big thing. Yeah. I think there's always different. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> I already ate half the box yesterday, so this is nice. Thank you, Lynn. Oh. Hot tamales. Do you like hot tamales? Okay. <laughs> Clearly, someone didn't just... That's nice. Oh, we'll always yeah, I don't uh, love hot candy. Like, we'll it's spicy hot. Drum like drum 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 cinnamon altoids. Yeah. Too much. Too much. Too much for me. This is fun that all of this is on the live recording. What else should I tell the world about hot tamales and cinnamon altoids? What else do we need to tell the people? secret we can reveal? 
know. No, uh, no tea on the. Uh, no national secrets for me. I know. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. He took all of them. Coming up short, guys. Be so fun. I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, okay. I'm out of practice on my teaching because I haven't gotten to teach my whole postdoc. So I'm so excited to tell people about my stuff. Did you want to teach? No, but I love teaching. So yeah. So with like the postdoc is like I'm like this is the last time I only research. For sure. Oh yeah, and it's a sweet time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not true. I really I published eight pages during my postdoc. Uh, I thought that substitution no, uh, form was a PDF. Yeah, but no, it'll be a big, big research that. focus now. But that's awesome. it'll be more teaching focused on that in the future. So that was just totally dumb of me. So I Am will I just redo all spring? those with those links. Yeah, yeah, it's so exciting. Even the inaugural spring. They're stuck, aren't they? Still. Oh, cool. Awesome. Do you do like a, a CW professor? We try to in the winter okay. because it's okay. hard to get people here. Do you guys pronounce it CWU or? I've heard CWU. I hear CWU. 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 Okay. I usually say CWU. I like CWU. Because I heard that and I had to, I was like, yeah, quickly brain. <laughs> what does this, what does this one mean? It's like, got it. At the time, your student had the CWU sweater on, so oh, I got yeah. it. I got it pretty quick. It's like, cool. I get it now. This energy is really nice. I know. It's great. It would be a good one because you can tell who's, you can kind of tell where the voices are coming from. So teaching wise, you can be like, oh, sorry, I heard you say something. Yeah. something. No, what, could right, you please? Yeah, could you please tell me more about what yeah. you just said? Jordan, when he teaches a year, usually has it like sit close. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, he's like, yeah. you over there in the back. Right. Yeah, Vandy only had um, like a couple big lecture theaters, and I had to go in and make announcements there sometimes. They had really steep staircases, like to the point that it was like you had to like hold onto the rail going down. Oh, it was scary. it was a little scary, yeah. And so I'd make presentations to those rooms like about like Maymaster, about whatever, and there'd just be like this like big amphitheater, and I'd have to like look up <laughs> and like talk to people. It was it was intimidating. This is a nice slow. Slow build. Good energy. Good energy. Good, energy. Like good turnout. I'm excited. Very good turnout. Too. I don't know. Maybe it isn't good turnout. It looks like good turnout <laughs> no, it to is. me. Yeah. Usually it's like packed, but no, it's, it's always like this. It's good. Yeah, usually this standing room only. I don't yeah, know. I people know. just want to not be into super eruptions. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Cool, okay. cool. <laughs> All right. Later, Gator. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming today. We are beginning this session. Great to have you all here. Great to see so many of you out enjoying the treats. No Vinmans this quarter. They're extra busy this spring, but Vinmans promises they'll be back in the fall. So if you're missing some of those special Vinmans treats, that will come in a few months from now. A couple of quick announcements, then we'll talk about the rest of the talks this spring, then a quick introduction of our speaker, and away we go. Uh, the TVs are on the fritz. I don't know what's going on, but we have somebody coming over this afternoon. So only one of those four TVs is working. Uh, I think I broke it personally this morning, so it's on me. Um, so anyway, if you want to move a little closer to see the screens, go for it. But otherwise, that's the scene, at least for right now. Uh, Bree McGinnis has forms. And if you have not signed forms to get permission to film you for these live streams, if you haven't done that with her yet this year, Please see her after. And uh, there's two forms. There's a form to give permission for us to film. And if that's the case, then most of the room is on camera occasionally. If you don't want to be filmed, that's also a form for that. And then you stay in the shadow zone in that opposite corner over there. So that's our routine, which we've been doing all year. Any other announcements by anybody? Anybody want to say anything fun or not fun? Yeah, OK. Uh, so. We have five talks scheduled for this spring. This is the first. It's been a while. It's been more than a month since we've done this, so we'll get back in the flow. So today, next Friday, and the following Friday, three Fridays in a row, we have talks. Uh, I'll introduce our speaker in just a second. Next Friday is April 21st. Jerome Lesman from Vancouver Island University will be down here speaking on the Cordier and Ice Sheet and Ice Sheet an ice sheet predisposed to outburst floods. And Jerome will be also working with the Geology 351 class both this next week and the following week. 
Uh, the following Friday at noon, Sky Cooley from Montana is driving over. He's talking about calcrete at Eastern Washington's geomorphic triple junction. Then we take a Friday off, then we're back at it with Kerry Gauzes, geology professor here, hydrogeology, and Kerry's giving a talk, groundwater storage and a sustainable water management solution. And then our final talk of the quarter, which is the last day of regular classes, Friday, June 2nd. Some of you know Max Needle, who's teaching geology, uh, geology 360, structural geology this quarter for us from the University of Washington. And Max will be giving a talk entitled Designing Video Game Style Field Geology Simulations for Research and Education. Okay, so those are our talks. You know that we live stream these. There's a live audience right now watching from distant places, but these remain as replays. And so they're very popular to watch in replay. So you're welcome to catch these afterwards as well. And look for your own face as you ask a question at the end of this. Our speaker today, Lydia Harmon undergraduate degree in geology from Occidental College in the Los Angeles area, both master's and PhD in geology from Vanderbilt University, Nashville, Tennessee. Colleague of Super Brad Pitcher, who was a graduate of here. And then currently a postdoc at Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. Hannah invited her up. Uh, they met each other for the first time at a conference in New Zealand this past winter. So the talk today from Lydia Harmon, Untangling the Magmas and Timing of a Super Eruption. Would you please help me welcome Lydia Harmon. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Lydia. Can everyone hear me? We're good in the back? Cool, all right. So yeah, today I'm gonna to be talking about untangling the magmas and timing of a super eruption. Um, and so thank you for coming to my talk. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I've already met with some really interesting students and uh, lab manager and professors. So um, please ask me a bunch of questions at this talk. If you don't uh, wanna in talk in front of everybody, please come ask me about my research or you know about your research. I'd love to hear from you. Um, and so what I wanted to start with uh, there we go. What I wanted to start with um, is the spectacular picture of a volcanic landscape. Um, this volcanic landscape is in the Taupo Volcanic Zone of New Zealand. Um, and I'm looking sort of to the north um, at this beautiful cone volcano called Naurahoe. Um, and this is sort of looking in the direction of one of the most active silicic volcanic areas in the world. And what we see about volcanic landscapes are just the surface expression of these volcanoes. Um, but um, we have only evidence of these systems through their erupted deposits. And so you can see here, I've highlighted the volcanic cone, a lava flow um, on the right-hand side of the screen, and a dike on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, but we can really only see them once they've erupted or once erosion has sort of shown what was going on underneath the surface. I mean, so here I use petrologic tools to help decipher the conditions and the depths of magma systems that actually sourced these eruptions. And so this is sort of the single giant body, the big vat model that we had in the 80s. And, and so this is sort of um, like what the sort of, uh, I guess, sort of the traditional view of what a magma body was. Notice the scale here. This is sort of 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. It's a huge vat of magma. We are evolving from this perspective. Over the last couple of decades of petrology, um, which is sort of the study of these volcanic rocks, um, we've sort of moved on from the big vat model um, to really we think of magma systems as more complex regions where you have regions of melt dominated, regions of crystal dominated, mushy areas. Um, and we sort of see these as sort of this transcrustal magma system. And so we represent, this, so this sort of represents the whole magma system. And where I'm focusing is on the upper crust. And I want to focus on what the silicic magma bodies erupt, um, or from where the silicic eruptions erupt from, from these magma bodies. And so you can have the single magma body that has a melt dominated region and a mushy region from which the melt rich magma is like extracted and then erupted. And so here are two examples um, of uh, big super eruption forming systems. But you can also, oh, there they are on the upper crust. Um, but there are now different ideas about configurations of these upper crustal magma bodies. So instead of just the one model of a single magma body sourcing these eruptions, now we can have multiple magma bodies, different melt pockets that come together to form these big super eruptions. And we also, um, not only, the reason that we know this is that we now have the ability to decipher them. And so we, um, we have instances of the single magma body and we also have instances we have instances of the single magma body, and we also have instances of multiple magma bodies sourcing these large eruptions. 
Um, and in all cases, these magma bodies represent a snapshot in time. So this is just, you know, 100 years, a snapshot of 100 years or so, um, where there's substantial amount of eruptible magma in the upper crust just prior to these large eruptions. And we want to reconstruct this to understand how the crust is actually capable of forming these magma bodies that then form these super eruptions. Is that, is that good so far? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, and please feel free if, I, if, I, if you don't understand something, you're like, whoa, 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 just stop me, put up your hand, I can, I can stop on the fly and answer questions. Um, but th these are the questions I'm actually gonna answer, um, is how many eruptible body, magma bodies exist prior to large eruptions? So is it one, is it multiple? How many if it's multiple? Um, what are the storage conditions of the eruptable magma bodies? When I talk about storage conditions, I'm predominantly looking at the pressure, which we think of as the depth. And so where are they um, in the crust? Also temperature, so pressure and temperature. And then how do the number and depths of the eruptable magma bodies change through the life cycle of a large magma system? So if I have multiple eruptions, how are these different, multi how are these different eruptions being sourced in the, sub in the subsurface? And then uh, this is a question that Hannah Shamlu um, delves into more than I do, but over what time scales are the magma bodies and magma systems active? So for this talk, I'll mostly be focusing on these three, but just note that this fourth question is a really big question in petrology. And so how do I do it? Um, these are the approaches. Um, I use sort of a, lots of different ways, but it's mostly fieldwork, lab work, and modeling. And so up there in the fieldwork, um, shout out to Dr. Brad Pitcher, who does a CWU alum in, I think it was 2011. And I imagine he gave uh, everyone, or I guess people who are here, he's pretty memorable because he gives people a little bit of trouble here and there. And you can see how excited he is about this tree that we found that would have been like in this eruption. And so Brad's like real high energy. If you ever meet him, you'll remember him. Um, and so we worked together at Vanderbilt University um, where he was a postdoc while I was in my grad school. Um, also, lab work is, um, is a big component of what I do. Um, that's one of my colleagues, Samantha Tremontano. She's working on an uh, electron microprobe um, at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, she's another superstar in the field. Um, and so just shout out to Sam Tran for doing some cool lab work. And then modeling, um, that is one of my friends, Liam Kelly, who's currently doing his PhD. Um, at Vanderbilt. And so it's sort of this combination of fieldwork, lab work, and modeling. And notice in all three, there are other people in these photos. This is not an only me doing this work. This is a big group of people. Um, we really can't do our work without, without our friends and our colleagues. Um, and so, um, and also notice another thing, oh man, I got so excited making this slide, um, that like the arrows go multiple ways. So a lot of people think fieldwork and then lab work and then modeling. But sometimes you do field work and then you do some lab work and you're like, ooh, I need to actually go relook at the field. I need to go look at the samples again. So then you go back to the lab work, but then you model some stuff and you're like, oh, I actually need to do some more lab work. So that's this multifaceted, very fun job that I have. Um, but through most of it, through all of these approaches, what I'm really looking at are little blebs of magma. And so these little blebs of magma are pumice clasts. Um, and that represents a little pocket of magma that was erupted um, and sort of maintains its crystal neighbors. And so here, the glass um, uh, preserves the composition of the melt in the magma. The crystals are the crystals that are in the magma. And then the vesicles are the bubbles. So we sort of preserve the different phases of the magma, um, which represents the melt being the glass um, and the crystals being the crystals and the vesicles being the bubbles. And so you have this little bleb of magma preserved and that preserves the composition of the eruptible magma body. So that's the stuff that actually erupts. In contrast to that, we have the magma mush from where the, mag the from where the sort of the liquid dominated eruptible stuff is extracted from. And notice that here they're in contact, but we have a couple of different configurations from where these different magma bodies, like um, how they can look in the crust. We either have um, contiguous magma bodies or non-contiguous magma bodies. And the one in orange contiguous, the eruptable magma is in contact with the magma mush. And then non-contiguous, we have the eruptable magma that has been extracted, moved up and then stored separately from the magma mush. And altogether, we call this the magma system. So um, if I get, hopefully I'm not too jargon heavy. I try hard not to be jargon heavy, but I fail all the time. Um, so hopefully those will be the words that I use. And if, if I say something you don't understand, please let me know. All right, so act one. Um, I work in the Taupo Volcanic Zone. Um, in the Taupo Volcanic Zone in New Zealand, which is Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, the WH sound makes an F. So I study the Fakamaro eruptions in the Taupo Volcanic Zone. And every time I forget to introduce that, everyone goes, wow. Um, so I'm glad I remembered to do that today. So I study the Fakamaro eruptions in the Taupo Volcanic Zone. And um, notice here that this doesn't look like one of the nice stratovolcanoes that you're used to seeing. Um, this is actually a caldera 
which is uh, basically a hole that's been blown out because there's been so much magma that's you know been erupted that it basically leaves like a crater in the ground. And so this lake back here is Lake Rotorua, which is from um, a very large eruption from the Tupelo Volcanic Zone. Um, the Tupelo Volcanic Zone um, uh, is abbreviated TVZ, but in New Zealand they say Z instead of Z, and so it'll be the TVZ for the rest of the talk. But the TVZ is just a region um, and I was like, oh, I wonder how far away Ellensburg to, TV, to the TVZ is. Um, I couldn't really fit them on the same globe. Um, so I tried my darndest, and they're about um, 11,400 kilometers apart, uh, just a quick 7,000, <laughs> a little over 7,000 miles. Um, but, uh, but basically, it's the other side of the world, but you guys have volcanoes in your backyard, so everyone has volcanoes pretty close to them. All right, so Tupelo Volcanic Zone, TVZ of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, it is a highly active um, silicic system. Um, there was an ignimbrite flare-up period from about 350 to 240,000 years ago. This was one of the most active times in the Tupelo Volcanic Zone history. There were seven or eight caldera-forming eruptions, and it erupted about over 6,000 cubic kilometers, which is so much. So if you think of like a cubic meter, has everyone ever like conceptualized of this? It's the coolest. So think of like a cubic meter is about the same as a cubic yard. And then think about a, a kilometer in this direction, a kilometer in this direction, a kilometer in this direction, that's a cubic kilometer. And now think of 6,000 of those. It's so much. Um, and uh, what's really, was especially exciting is that the eruption that I focused on, which is the Fukamaru eruption, erupted almost 3,000 cubic kilometers. So half of that, you can see here um, in the bottom of the screen right here, this is a log scale of uh, erupted volume. And so this is the Fukamaru eruption, erupted over 3,000 cubic kilometers. Wow. Um, and here's another visualization of it. Notice that these stair steps indicate sort of the volume of magma through time. And this big stair step is the Fukamaru group at about 350 to 340,000 years ago. Um, on, the, on the right side of the screen is the top of volcanic zone in New Zealand. And you can see that uh, the different colors represent the different eruptions here. Um, everything in yellow is the, is the Fukamaro, and, the, um, and everything else is sort of this eruptions that happened after it that have covered it. Oh, it's just so much. Everything is volcanic there. It's very exciting. Um, all right, and so those were their ignimbrite deposits. Um, but there's sort of a couple different eruption styles that, um, that I look at. One is a pyroclastic fall, and the other is a pyroclastic flow. And so when these big eruptions happen, they go up and out like that. And also they can they have this much faster sort of cloud of ash, gas, pumice class, very, very energetic um, coming down, which is pyroclastic flow. And so if you look here at pyroclastic fall, how do, you, how do you guys think it would actually like look in the field after it, after it deposited? What would it look like? Yeah, like an ash layer, and what else? And what would it look like? Stratified, and stratified ash layer, yeah, and it would like cover topography. As opposed to the pyroclastic flow, what would it look like? N not stratified, yeah, not stratified. And what it does is it infills topography. And so we have this pyroclastic fall or tephra that's stratified, usually finer grained, and you can actually see the timing of the different eruptions because they just fall right on top of each other, as opposed to these ignimbrites that just blah, 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 down these valleys and they fill in topography, they're poorly sorted, um, and they sort of represent this like really small snapshot in time. So yeah, so I'll be talking about both pyroclastic falls and pyroclastic flows with the Fukumaru ignimbrites. So, um, oh, I said 3,000 cubic kilometers. I think I, I meant to say 2,000, my bad. So greater than 2,000 cubic kilometers, um, and uh, they erupted about 350,000 years ago. And um, they're particularly crystal rich by Talpa Volcanic Zone standards. And also, we know already that it's a complex eruptive system because people have done some work before me. Whew. Um, I didn't start from scratch here. Um, and so there are multiple ignimbrite units that are shown on the right side in the different colors, multiple ignimbrite units that make up the Fukumara eruption, but they don't overlap in the field. Some go off to the west. Let's see if I have that slide. Yeah, some go off to the west, some go off to the east, and there's very little overlap to tell you which one came first, second, third, fourth, or something like that. And so um, most of the volume is erupted as ignimbrites that went to the west and the east. And there has been some excellent work um, in the late 90s um, that um, I could not have done my PhD without um, Stuart Brown, who had worked on this system in the late 90s. And he sort of conceptualized of the magma body as being this sort of different, there are different compositions, but it's a single vat of magma. And when he had done this work, they hadn't had that paradigm shift to the transcrustal system yet. He was still working under big vat model. So we're like, ooh, I bet we could update this model. 
The other thing, um, as well as um, Stuart Brown, who was working on this, there was another guy called Manning. I actually don't know Manning's, but David. David Manning uh, was doing this fantastic study. Um, if you ever go to New Zealand and you ever want to study tephra from pyroclastic falls, Manning is the thesis you go to. He did an incredible amount of detailed work on looking at the stratigraphy of all these different fall deposits. And he um, purported that there is a specific fall deposit um, that was related to the Fakamara eruptions. And notice that um, in the bottom uh, right of the screen, you can see the distal tephra, so the tephra that went much further away. Um, the Fakamara was such a large eruption or eruptions that it really went you know, thousands of kilometers away. So we can look at both the fall deposits and the ignimbrites, of which are from the pyroclastic flow deposits, um, to, um, to sort of figure out what was going on prior to eruption. And so the questions that I'm asking um, uh, require um, a few different sort of um, uh, tools to, to, to answer. So for the how many eruptable magma bodies exist um, prior to large eruptions, I look at both whole rock pumice and pumice glass compositions. What are the storage conditions of eruptable magma bodies? Um, I use a program called Rhyolite Melts, which looks at the geobarometry to understand the depth of the magma bodies. And then I also use zircon saturation geothermometry to understand the temperatures. And then how do the number and depths of the eruptable magma bodies change the life cycle of a large magma system? Um, I look at the stratigraphy of the tephras. Okay, so desired info. Uh, the reason that I need to understand, use all these different tools is to understand the different magma types. I use pumice compositions, and luckily I have those in both the fall deposits and the ignimbrite deposits, so I can compare. Double check mark. Um, for the depth of magma storage, I use rhyolite mounts storage calculations. I have those in both the fall deposits and the ignimbrites. And then for the temperature of magma storage, I use zircon saturation geothermometry calculations. Guess what? I have them in both. Um, but the depth and extraction, depth and composition of magma extraction, so where was that mush that, um, that the magmas are extracted from? Again, I use rhyolite mounts extraction calculations. Ooh, don't get those from the fall deposits, but I do get them from the ignimbrite deposits. So I'm like, okay, at least in one. And then finally, sequence of eruptions, the field relationships of the tephra, I do have those in the fall deposits, but I just told you, nothing in the ignimbrites there. And so it's really the combination of both the tephra and the ignimbrites that allows me to totally understand all this desired info from these, from these eruptions. Cool. So the integration is what I'm really after, is looking at both the tephra and the ignimbrites. Um, and so since this eruption produced both, um, we can really sort of look at both of them in fall plus flow to try to figure, figure out these questions of what was going on prior to eruption. Okay, so uh, what I do, pumice compositions. These are just a few images of the pumice compositions um, that, I, that I analyzed. I analyzed quite a few. Um, and I got major and trace elements um, that use independent methods from a lot of them. These are from, uh, these pumice images are from my tephra. Um, they're very small. Notice they're sort of lapilli size, so you can literally like pinch them between your fingers like this. That was the biggest size I had, so that's what I used. Um, and, then, uh, and then for the, um, and I also had some ignimbrite, Pumice, pumice collected from ignimbrites as well. For the pressure calculations, um, I, this is one of like the bread and butter of what I use. Um, my PhD advisor is one of the um, one of the big um, contributors to this program called Rhyolite Melts. But basically, what I use is the um, mineral and glass phase equilibria um, to figure out the pressures and temperatures. So if you think of like a phase diagram. You can basically track the temperature and pressure of where a mineral will saturate. So in pressure and temperature space, you can be like, these are the, this is the sort of the line at which one mineral will saturate. You can also do that for multiple minerals. So once you have multiple minerals, you have these sort of surfaces coming together. And if you then look at it uh, in equilibrium with a glass composition, you can figure out for the pressure and temperature at which those at which that glass was in equilibrium with the mineral assemblage that you have. Um, I can talk a lot more about this, but that's the basics. Um, so you need to know your mineral, you need to know what minerals you have, and you need to know your glass composition. What else do I want to say here? I think that might be it. Oh yes, one thing is that in the case of using the glass, uh, if I put if I input the glass composition here, I get a storage pressure. However, if I input the whole rock composition, then I get an extraction pressure. So I can use a similar method, but just with a different input to get storage conditions and extraction conditions to try to figure out the transcrustal uh, view of, of what's going on. Okay, cool. So act two, the fall deposits. Um, I could not have done this work um, without uh, quite a few people in this photo. You can see the fall deposits in the background of this photo. Um, you can also already see the stratification there. Um, this was originally um, looked at by um, 
um, by Manning. Um, and it's a few different places in the Bay of Plenty called the Kohuawa Cliffs and the Otarawaguiri Cliffs. And notice that they're way outside of the Ignimbrite range here, um, but both of them are on the coast. Um, and so, um, so yeah, the, and so yeah, they're just outside the Ignimbrite realm. And so here, um, again, man, Brad Pitcher's in this a lot. Here's Brad over here. Um, he, he, I mean, he makes himself known, Super Brad. Um, so Super Brad and um, a few others um, and I came and collected samples through this, um, through this unit. We collected five to six lapilli class per sample. And we did both major element um, and trace element compositions for the glass on each. And then also rhyolite melts, geobarometry, and zircon saturation geothermometry on each of the class. Um, and so I had um, 22 horizon, oh, I guess I'm not there yet. But um, in the rest of the presentation, I'll show diagrams like the one on the right, but realize that's just a cross section through the deposits and sort of a stylized view of what the, of what the, um, what the um, uh, field, field areas look like. Um, but yeah, we went through very detailed and did all the did all the grain size analysis and stuff. And so there are two sequences. Um, there are 22 horizons from one of, from the one on the left and eight horizons from the one on the right. Uh, I collected five class from each horizon. Um, and to note, there are three or four paleosols in each of the in each of the horizons. And so that gives me a sense of time of where the Fukumara eruptions happened and what was going on before and what happened afterwards. And so the correlations between the two out. Uh, out crops are marked with dashed lines, and those are really helped by the paleosols, which are those little vertical wiggles coming down. Um, and so, yeah, so there are quite a lot of, um, there are quite a lot of um, different pumice clasts. The places in red, um, that's where the Fakamaro is. So I have pre-Fakamaro, Fakamaro in red, and then post-Fakamaro in the teal. So just to remind you the questions. Um, the first one I'll talk about is how many eruptable magma bodies exist prior to large eruptions. And uh, luckily for me, um, you can figure out the different magma bodies because their compositions are different. And so I have three different types of magma um, based on the three compositions, um, or ba based on these compositions. And so through all the different, like all these tiny little pumice glass that I was analyzing for hours upon end, um, I found that they bend into three different groups, um, types A, B, and C. Um, luckily, they indeed match published data from the Fakamaru. And they're different um, from both the pre-Fakamaru and the post-Fakamaru, and also different from most other things that erupted in the TVZ. And even though you don't see them being, even though this blue overlaps with the other ones here, notice that this is just um, barium versus strontium space. And so since I looked at lots of different major elements, you can start seeing how in lots of different spaces, you can still pull apart these three groups. The red and the orange are more similar. The blue is a little bit more off to the side. This is the one, um, uh, uh, calcium versus silica, that I like first noticed this. And then those are different from the rest of the stuff in the sequence. And those are way different from everything else in the TVZ. Um, if you're like, whoa, that was a lot of bivariate plots. Please don't show me any more geochemistry. I totally understand. Um, don't worry. I will show you only a little bit more. Um, but what I really want to show you is that here, notice the red, orange, and blue at the top. That's the, that's the tephra fall deposit. And notice that it overlaps well with this stuff in here, because this is the published data from, the, from Fakamaru. Um, and, so, and it's different from the other stuff in the Taupo Volcanic Zone. And so hopefully I've convinced you. If I haven't convinced you, let me know. I'll try harder. But um, notice that the red and the orange are pretty similar. They're slightly different from the blue. But notice that here, um, you can still see that they are different from everything else in the TVZ. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Yeah, so it's different. So I've hopefully shown that, number one, the, co the Tefra sequence is indeed part of the Fukumaro. So we're like, got it. They are, they are indeed a matching eruption. And uh, number two, that there are three magma types. So I'm interpreting these three magma types to be three distinct magma bodies, um, which then asks the question, are, were all magma types erupting over the duration of the eruption sequence? And so what I do is I can look through space, or excuse me, through time with the Tefra sequence are um, different sort of um, different periods of eruptions. So, so if you look here in the very bottom, in the very, very bottom um, horizon, it's only blue. So it's only the type blue that exists. And then in the sort of middle section through most of it, you can see the blue plus the red. And so hopefully you can see here, it's just blue, 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 blue. Um, up here, it's blue plus red, blue plus red, blue plus red. And then it's only at the very top that you see the orange. And so there are sort of three different sort of styles. You have blue, blue plus red, and then in the top there is blue plus red plus orange, but orange is the dominant, 
the dominant one. And that's the and that shows up both in, in both different sequences, which is whew, which I'm really glad it did. I'm um, really glad we sampled the bottom, the middle, and the top of this second one because it was a more sparsely sampled area. But that gives us confidence that we do sort of see these these different patterns. Um, and so here we have um, now I'm looking in pressure versus temperature space. Because I really want to be able to say that these red and the the red and the orange, like, are they actually two different ones? Are they the same? Uh, not really sure yet. But what you can see here is that they're all um, stored pretty shallow. Um, so 100 megapascals um, is 3.7 kilometers depth. And so these are sort of from like mostly from three to five kilometers, let's say, mostly from three to five kilometers. So they're pretty shallow. They seem to be all stored at a pretty similar depth. But notice that the temperature here is a little bit different. This red and the orange is um, cooler than the blue. And so overall, what I see from this stuff, from magma body storage, now I'm sort of hopefully showing you maybe a magma body of these three different magma, three different magma bodies um, with probably slightly different, slightly different temperatures. And so there are at least two. I'm not positive about red and orange yet. I showed them differently because I know what's coming in the rest of the talk. But, um, but there are at least red and orange are, are sort of part of one thing. And blue is distinctly different, right? Um, and they have consistent shallow um, conditions on the order, oh, good, I got it right, on the order of about 2.8 to 4.6 kilometers. Um, and then type A is hotter than type B and type C. And then what we want to know is how do the number and depths of the eruptible magma bodies change through the life cycle of a large magma system? Type A and type B erupt through most of the Fukumara eruptions. Type C only erupts at the very end because it's at the very top um, and only erupts during the final stages. And we have no information yet on the extractions. We have no idea what the magma body, where the magma bodies were extracted from in that mush zone um, before they erupted. But we're going to find out because we're going to go to Act 3, which is the ignimbrites. And so here... Um, this is a picture of a different ignimbrite called the Matakina ignimbrite. Um, Hannah and I got to go to this, um, this very ignimbrite um, in January when we were there in the field. But notice that this is totally different field-wise from the tephra that we'd seen. Uh, this is just a giant ignimbrite. You have pumice sort of up to this size, and you have ash and down to ash size. So you have this very poorly sorted ignimbrite. Um, notice how tiny we are in this wall of ignimbrite. That would have been a wall of ash and gas and pumice moving towards the beach, this is near the beach, towards the beach um, during this time of an eruption. Um, this eruption, the Marihina ignimbrite, um, is about an order of magnitude smaller than the eruptions that I study. So even this giant eruption is still 10 times smaller than the eruption that I study. It's, it's real big. Um, there, it's a little scary. Um, and the, the TVZ has produced a lot of these large eruptions. So these are pretty massive, um, pretty sort of um, life-changing, literally, for anything that had been living here. Um, beforehand. So just to give you a sense of scale of these ignimbrites. And they're, the, they're so pretty. Okay, so for the ignimbrites, um, the methods are, are similar that I still go and collect rocks. Um, but we, one thing that I needed to do here is I tried to sample all of the ignimbrites. Notice that most of my points are on the western side of, of, this, of this chart. Um, that is just because um, most of them are, that, that was where they had the best pumice class. Um, a lot of this ignimbrite is welded. Um, which means that it's, it was hot enough that it could sort of re-weld and fuse the glass back together, so it creates these cliffs. Um, and so it was, it was tough to sample it. Um, sometimes the glass was altered. Um, sometimes it, you just couldn't see it. Um, it had been covered. Sometimes it was way over there on that cliff, but how do you get there? Um, and so it became, it, it's sort of difficult to sort of have this, uh, this sampling mission that you're like, oh, I need to go collect all this pumice, but you're like, oh, I can't get there. Um, and so you work with what you have. And um, I think that was one one motivation for this project was that no one had ever worked on the tephra side of things, the fall, but people had worked on the ignimbrite. And I'm like, well, if I just get a little bit more of the ignimbrite data, but really work on that tephra sequence, maybe I can tell something that people haven't been able to tell before. And so this is sort of the power of using the sort of the two methods. Um, and as well, the other thing that I did here that was different was within a single pumice class um, from the ignimbrite, I was able to test or I was able to do the composition of both the whole rock and the glass of the same ignimbrite pair. So I have double information on the single erupted chunk of magma. So that was that's that was a big advance um, that uh, that like my group and a few other groups are are starting to do is like really understanding how is this single parcel of magma, how can we track that, which is really important when you're looking at something that has multiple magma bodies. Okay. Um, yes. 
I don't think I need to say anything else about that. Oh yeah, to remind you. Oh yeah, I could have could have could have just hit the next slide. Um, so yeah, so just to remind you, yeah, this is a bleb of magma, but the pumice clast. And so um, and so we're looking at sort of the eruptable magma body versus the magma mush. But here is where you have the pumice clast. You can have information from both the eruptable magma body and from the magma mush with the whole pumice clast from the ignimbrite, which I couldn't do with the tiny pumice clast from the tephra. Sound good? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so here, um, these different uh, magma types, are, these are now the whole rock compositions, not the glass compositions. So this, uh, it looks very similar. I know these plots are exactly, it looked very similar, but this is a different type of information being shown here. And these, uh, there are four different types of magma, primary, uh, first defined by Brown in 1998, which was the thesis that I looked at, and confirmed by later studies that there are these four magma, magma types. Um, and then the, the uh, squares are my data. And so I was like, yes, we have four magma types. It's excellent. So before when I was showing you type A, B, and C from the Tephra, like I had a bit of a, it wasn't a premonition. It was very much published work that I was able to build on to even be able to consider that there might be multiple magma bodies. Um, and so here with the whole rock compositions, um, you can see that I have um, all four types of magma from the, from the ignimbrites. You can see these four different types of magma similarly in different sort of compositional space. Um, and so you can, and, and with this different compositional space, you can, um, you can start to know a little bit more about the, um, about the um, mineralogy, as well as sort of like these different sort of, these different sort of uh, magma types here. And notice that uh, luckily all of the four types are sort of pulled apart in different space. Even if they're cl close together in certain spaces, other, other mineralogical or other elemental spaces pull them apart. Um, and this is uh, what was really fun here is that I have paired whole rock and glass ignimbrite compositions. So this is the pumice class where I have the whole rock from it and the glass from the same from the same rock, um, which is which becomes really powerful because you can basically connect the dots between the different types of whole rock and glass. And this is where finally I'm convinced that the type B and type C are different because you have pretty similar whole rock compositions, but they really sort of separate themselves in the glass on that red and that orange down there. So you have red and orange pretty close with whole rock, super more separate with the, with the glass. Um, and here I'm also pretty convinced that the, um, that the types B and C are different from the type A and D. So the red and the orange are different from the blue and the green. And so here, um, this, this is just um, strontium versus barium, and then zirconium versus silica. Um, and so this confirms, in general, the compositional similarity between type B and type C. Um, here on the zirconium, on the right-hand plot, this indicates that zircon, the mineral zircon, is saturated in all magma types. That's because the whole rock zirconium is higher than the glass glass zirconium. And so basically what happens is that the little zircon crystals preferentially um, incorporate zirconium, or zircon crystals preferentially incorporate zirconium, there we go, um, into their structure. And so if there is more zirconium in the whole rock, then that means, than in the glass, then that means that a lot of that, um, a lot of that zirconium has been taken in by the zircon. So that was a lot of zircon and zirconium, sorry. Um, basically, <laughs> basically um, you can see that there is the mineral zircon in all of these magma bodies. And then on the graph on the left-hand side, the barium partitioning, um, how barium um, goes into the whole rock and the glass, indicates that type B and type C have a mineral called sanidine. And so sanidine is saturated in type, a, type B and type C, the red and the orange. It is not saturated in the blue and the green, type A and D. And so this, um, you can really use the glass compositions from the ignimbrites to confirm the glass types of the tephras and also to understand the mineralogy that we might not be able to see um, in, the, in the mineral, or in the, pumice clump in the, in the actual pumice class. Even if you don't see sanidine, even if you don't see zircon, you know that it's there based on the chemistry. This is just another way to show that they're different, basically. Okay, so now timing of the eruptions. Um, so the timing of the eruptions has been a has been a big problem in the TVZ for a long time. A bunch of people have published a lot of different things on it, and uh, no one could come to a consensus because you can't see them together in the field. You don't know which ignimbrite came from where. You don't know which magma body erupted this ignimbrite or that ignimbrite. Some of the ignimbrites, like especially the one on the west and the orange, um, which is called the Fakamaru ignimbrite, which is extra confusing because they have different names all this stuff. But basically, you um, in the in this ignimbrite on the west side, you see multiple magma types within the eruption. And so you're like, well, how, well then, how do you know like which magma body was going off at the, at the right time? And this is where you can use the timing of the tephra to sort of help you figure out where the different, where the different ignimbrites went through time, through the eruption. And so on the, on the east side, I have these two points as well as 
yeah, I have these two points and this point. It is only type A. And remember, the place that I found only type A was just this bottom horizon. So you can start seeing that maybe the ignimbrites went off to the east first. Anytime you see only type A, you're like, oh, is that an early eruption? Probably. And so, um, and so there are a couple points up here as well that have sort of only type A. And so you might, um, so you, well, I might, um, I did. Um, uh, you might, I did. Um, so you can use the distribution to say, oh, maybe those are early erupted. However, the majority of the, of the deposits over here also have a red in them. Um, and so you have the blue plus red, which notice indicates pretty much this whole sort of middle chunk here. I mean, so these might be sort of the intermediate where the bulk of the eruption actually happened. And then the orange, which is only found up here, note is only in this sort of little section up here. And so that to me indicates that there is some pulse to the, to the east, a lot of a big pulse to the right, and then the final sort of fan of ignimbrite probably went up to that northwest. That could also indicate where the magma bodies were within the caldera. So like they, because we know that they're at the same pressure, so they didn't stack on top of one another. They were probably like around each other in a, you know, in sort of map space, but I haven't done a lot of work on that. So that's just, that's still, I'm still proposing, you might, I still also might. Um, and so, yeah, so, but basically you can see east, mostly west, northwest. So that's sort of how you can use the distribution of the ignimbrites in conjunction with the fall deposits to understand the timing of the ignimbrite eruptions. How am I doing on time? Oh, I'm, oh, I'm great, cool. Um, great. Um, yeah, I do, I do talk quickly, so hopefully that wasn't too fast. I get excited talking about my stuff, so yeah, great. So hopefully everyone's hanging on like as I'm like, oh. Um, okay, so now I want to tell you about the magma body storage and the magma body extraction as well. So, so far we've only talked about the storage, right? That's where the magma body was prior to eruption. Um, and that's in these solid colors up here. So I did the same, the same sort of storage pressures again. Um, for, for these for the ignimbrite compositions. And so I have this storage zone sort of in that three to five kilometer range. Um, but then I'm like, well, what about the whole magma system? What about these, ex where is the mush? Where did these magmas come from? And I can, use the, I can use the whole rock in order to figure that out. And I'm gonna focus on the red and the orange here. Um, notice here that there is only one zone highlighted, highlighted um, because with the extraction, with the extraction pressures, um, I can tell that it would have to be a quartz plus feldspar composition. It could be other things as well, but quartz and feldspar have to be there. Um, and so, with with those constraints, um, I know that the red and the orange types were extracted from the sort of 200 to 275 region. And so I can tell that these uh, types, um, the red and the orange type, type B and type C, were sort of were extracted from the same region, moved up in the crust, and then were erupted. So we have this as non-contiguous, um, non-contiguous storage and extraction. Um, in contrast, um, the blue is a little tricky um, because of the different in, in composition. It depends. It depends on a thing called oxygen fugacity. Um, to to basically figure out what was the actual pressure that it was extracted from. Has anyone heard of oxygen fugacity? Yeah, it's it's a it's a tough concept. Um, maybe someone here explains it way better than it was explained to me. But for the longest time, it's the partial pressure of oxygen. And I'm like, why does it matter about oxygen? Um, for the purposes of today, it basically dictates the iron two plus to iron three plus ratio in a magma. And so, what depends on iron two plus and iron three plus? What minerals can form? And so, with a different oxygen fugacity, which means a different iron two plus to iron three plus ratio, you will get different minerals forming. Hopefully, yeah, I saw like a couple nods and maybe it's just because I'm nodding at you, but everyone went, mm-hmm. Yeah, so, woo, great. Yeah, so oxygen fugacity. Um, I'm sure someone who studied oxygen fugacity would be like, no. But for me, I think that's a pretty pretty good way to explain it. But basically, it, it dictates what different minerals will form, especially like things, what, what minerals have more iron in them? What types of minerals? What? Yeah, like magnetite. What else? What else is iron in it? What? Hematite, magnetite, hematite. Yeah. What else? Pyrite is it? Yeah. Also, what else? Think volcanic, volcanic rocks. Sorry, what was that one? There was one that there was someone said it right. Oh no! Everyone's like, oh no! I was not prepared to. I was I was not prepared to answer questions here. Um, but what's like the general? Like you have like you have sort of like the general category of minerals that have more iron in them. Iron and magnesium. Mafic, yeah. Generally, more mafic minerals are going to be dictated by the iron, by the oxygen fugacity of the system, because that depends on the two plus to three plus ratio. So things, uh, things like um, 
pyroxenes are super, because they have both iron, magnesium, and the structure, things like pyroxene are really sensitive. And as well, things like magnetite, the iron titanium oxides are really, really sensitive to the oxygen fugacity of a system. And so, wow, now I'm getting into, I had too much, I had more time and now I'm excited about oxygen fugacity. I shouldn't have looked at the clock. Um, it says everybody. Um, but yeah, so, um, but basically what happens here is that depending on this oxygen fugacity, which is based on this, it says delta N and O, um, but notice that the numbers change here. Um, basically, depending on the oxygen fugacity, that depends what minerals you'll get and also what pressures and temperatures you'll get those minerals. And so what's happening here is that I can't tell. Uh, the long and short of it, <laughs> short story long, I can't tell exactly where these magmas are being extracted from because it depends on this, ex this parameter, oxygen fugacity. Um, and so what I can tell you is that if I knew oxygen fugacity better, I would be able to tell you if these magmas were extracted from a similar depth to the red and the orange, if these blue magmas were extracted from a similar depth, or if they are extracted from much deeper. So either my two scenarios, my two scenarios are either that they were extracted from a similar pressure, a similar depth, and that, which was going to be shallow, and then they're erupted, or they're extracted from different depths. They both get stored at similar pressures, and then they erupt. And I'm still not sure. Um, my, my, sort of my, my thoughts is that I think that they're probably extracted from a more similar depth, because I think here, and especially in the top of volcanic zone, things are structurally and tectonically controlled. And so if you think it's a, it's a, it's a weirdly extending subduction zone, it's very cool, um, very cool tectonically. Um, but I think that these are sort of, there is this sort of consistent sh shallow storage zone. And I think there is probably a consistent extraction zone as well. Based on the based on the tectonics and the structure of the system, but the jury is still out. I don't know. Um, I'm ex I'm excited for anyone to come up with a better way to measure the oxygen fugacity in these systems. So if anyone has ideas, please let me know. Um, and um, and so that was way more oxygen fugacity than I was going to go into. I was, was thank you for holding on for that. Um, and so I will sort of leave you with the questions that I have hopefully answered. Um, so how many eruptable magma bodies exist prior to large eruptions? At least two, at least the blue and the red plus orange, but maybe as many as four. Um, I think I can split up the red and the orange. Um, and the green is kind of a weird one as well. Um, I didn't talk too much about the green, but that's okay. But um, at least two, maybe four. So we have multiple magma bodies. And I can confidently say that type B and C magmas are compositionally related, and they are not immediately related to that blue type A. Um, what are the storage conditions of the eruptable magma bodies? I am confident that they are consistent shallow magma storage of about three to five kilometers, everything three to five kilometers, big zone. Um, and I can say that type A is hotter than type, the red, the blue, the blue is, is hotter than the red and the orange. Um, and then the red and the orange are mineralogically distinct from most other TBZ magmas. I just showed you how they were distinct from the, from the blue Fakamaro magmas, but they're compositionally distinct from most other magmas in the region through time, very cool. Um, and then how do the number and depths of the eruptile magma bodies change through the life cycle of a large magma system? Um, type A and type B erupt through most of the eruptions. Though we have type C erupting only during the final stages. And then we have the, the oh, sorry, I keep going back and forth between type A and B and then the colors, but um, type B and the red and the orange are likely extracted from a quartz plus feldspar source, while type A and type D are likely extracted from a plagioclase or the pyroxene source. Um, and I'm not sure where they are, where they are in relation to each other. So the, so we're still, still waiting on that. Um, which is basically waiting on me. Um, so we'll, we'll, I'll get there sometime in the future. Um, but the one thing I want you to go away with, the only thing that you have to remember from this talk is that the Fukumari eruptions are derived from a complex magma system. So we don't have that single vat. We have those multiple vats. And I think that um, really over the last you know, decade, 10, 20, 30 years, there's been so much work showing this shift from the single large vat of magma to now we have this transcrustal magma system that it's a really exciting time to be in igneous petrology because we're learning so much and so much is changing so quickly. And we see all these different volcanoes and these different volcanic systems doing all these interesting, unique things um, that I think it's really, um, really exciting to be able to say that it derived from a complex magma system. But really I'm excited to see like where we go as a science so that we can actually tease apart these different complex magma systems worldwide. And so um, those were my questions. And um, with that, I will take your questions. Thank you, Lydia. Questions for Lydia and 
if you wouldn't mind repeating the question oh, so sure. that our home folks can listen. I have one in the back. Mm-hmm. And, and inferred all the way down to about 50 kilometers, all these, rather than like a magnet paper, like you're talking about, all these, like they call them pancake shaped sills. Yeah. And what was interesting is those sills are tilted upwards towards the illusion. So it's like the lithosphere plate. Oh, that's cool. Long, but it, and it's coming from, you know, this melt is coming from the magma. So my question is does that, I mean, that's a hot spot rather than an article that you're dealing with. But does that change, has that seeped in a new pathology and kind of? They're kind of saying that's like what, what you said, only even more so. Like the whole concept of a magma chamber is, doesn't really apply if, if this image is right. I mean, it's more like it's a slurry that's mostly solid, mm -hmm. hundreds of cracks, mm -hmm. all being swept along, and yada, yada, yada. So I was just wondering whether that has had an impact on the world of the technology. Sure. Yeah, this is going to be a really fun question to repeat. Um, so, <laughs> so, so the que the question started as um, like there there's been recent evidence of multiple pancake much thinner sills than an individual magma body, even the size that I'm thinking about. And um, even though that paper was done in Kilauea or in Hawaii in the hotspot volcanism, how does that how does that sort of translate to different igneous petrol or different volcanic systems? And can we conceptualize as much thinner sills than, say, just an individual magma body or even multiple magma bodies? Is that? All right, cool, great. I'm glad. Whew. Um, that was that was the hard part. Um, no, um, but it was an excellent question. Um, so um, totally agree. I think that there is a. Well, how do I answer this? There are so many. Oh, man, there's so many things. Um, so I think one thing to think about is that that was seismically imaged at a time that there wasn't a large super eruption forming system. And so you're looking at a you're looking at a snapshot of like something that isn't about to erupt catastrophically. And so we do think of um, we do think of these different magma these sort of magmatic systems as mostly solid through their lifetimes with little sills of melt uh, melt dominated regions um, I think that one thing um, one thing to think about is like leading up to a super eruption or leading up to a large eruption there has to be at least tens if not hundreds of kilometers pooled together in order to erupt and so I think that super eruptions or even large eruptions really represent sort of really uh, unique time scales um, in the in the Earth's history, when you do have sort of this pooling of magma, but I know that, like for instance, like in in Krafla in Iceland, um, which is an extensional system, totally different from the um, um, convergent system of a subduction zone or even a hotspot volcano, that you do see these again, these little sills, um, and those are really shallow, like they've drilled into these like little miniature rhyolite sills, um, and so. I think it's totally possible that you can have these sort of mostly mushy dominant, mostly solid sort of times in a volcanic period. But if you have a large eruption, you eventually need to get er enough eruptable magma together to actually erupt. Um, yeah, but I do think it is changing. Like we, when we now think of like the transcrustal magma magma system, you see that like, oh, maybe I'll go back to the beginning of, beginning of the talk. Oh boy. Uh, no, no. That one, and so now you do sort of see that it's it's predominantly it's predominantly mush all the way up, but I do think that yeah, I think the more we start imaging and sort of the better sort of resolution we get, because I think one problem is that we have these like seismic, uh, we have these sort of seismic images or we have these individual studies, um, but it's it's not as well it's not as well defined as it's shown here. Like we only have like a few pixels of information, um, and so by getting more more pixels of information, like you can start resolving the actual sort of crust through time, both through times where there isn't a magma large magma body there, but um, hopefully we don't ever have to image a large magma body that's like ready to go. That would be terrifying. Um, but um, but yeah, I think you're starting to get a better image of the crust. That was really long winded. Hopefully that I think so. Yeah. Yes. Mark in England asks, can the time scales for individual flows be extrapolated from your work? Um, the individual, like individual ignobrites? Yeah, Probably. can the time, oh, so the can the time scales of flow, individual flows be extracted from the information? Extrapolated from your work. Oh, so individual like eruption time scales. I, you know, honestly, I think that's a better question for Hannah Shamlu. Um, she works much more on the timing of the different um, eruptions. Um, right now, there's um, 
there's a bit of disagreement, I would say, and not, not disagreement, we just haven't come to a consensus in the community of how long eruptions take. Because I call these eruptions, but they could, but the dating says that they, you know, they erupted over, you know, less than 10,000 years. And you're like, well, that's not a single eruption. I'm like, I know. But in terms of like geologic history, it's definitely a snapshot in time. Um, I cannot personally date to that degree the individual flows. There has been some um, argon-argon dating done on sanidine that can that constrains it to being within about 5,000, all these flows happening within about 5,000 years of one another. But, um, but we think they came from the same magma system. There was a lot of magma erupted. Do I know how fast each of them happened? No, but I can tell you, I can at least give you an idea that there were no paleosols in the Tefra record. Sorry, let me show you again. Yeah, that one. Um, notice that there were no paleosols here um, from the base to the top of the Fukamara eruptions, but there is a paleosol at the top here, and there is a paleosol before, oops, before. So both paleosols before and after the Fukamara eruptions. So I can at least give you like a time scale saying they had to happen within a relatively short time period because paleosols can start forming a hundreds-ish to thousands-ish years, depending on, depending on um, weather conditions and temperature conditions at the time. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is bleb now a scientific term? Oh, oh, my little bleb. Yeah, the question was, is bleb now a scientific term? Um, I think I've seen it published here and there. Like, I think there's like one or two papers that have bleb published. Um, and so I'm really, I'm really going for it, hoping that bleb is published. Have you seen, you've seen it. It's, it started. Yeah, we, um, I will say that's kind of a, a silly part of igneous petrology is that we have these terms that are defined differently in different papers. And I think that's a product of geology being a fairly young science in general, is that it's not as established as say physics or biology that have been going on for you know, hundreds of years. Um, geology you know, has gone through these like paradigm shifts in the 80s and 90s. Like um, maybe that seems like a long time ago for like Gen Z, but like I remember the 90s. Um, and so like, I don't remember like the paradigm shift, but, um, but I was a child in the 90s. So I'm not that, uh, um, but, uh, but still, I remember the 90s. And so I feel like it's such a young science that we're still coming up with these terms and still coming up with like our consensus on like, what is mush? What is eruptible magma? Like, at what point do you start calling it magma? Is it at 1% melt, at 5% melt, at 99% melt? It's, it's, it's a tough, we, we work in sort of, we work in sort of um, odd, intersection between chemistry and physics space and geology space. But um, we work at sort of chemistry plus physics space. And so the words are the words are challenging. So yeah, the question is bleb a word, yes, but also other things that probably shouldn't be words or words and other things that we haven't defined yet should be better defined. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Thanks. Um, I was getting hung up on how what you were using to estimate an extraction storage mm. Yes. How did I actually do that? Yeah. yeah so, um, so the question was um, between storage pressure and extraction pressure. How do I how do I calculate both of them differently? Yeah, I did speed right through that despite taking time on FO two. Um, but so, oh no, it's before that. Sorry, I'll show you again. So I use um, I don't need a I don't need a I don't think I need this. I'm now now I'm here. So now I'm gonna get it. Uh, there we go. Um, so that's that's where I uh, look at rhyolite melts. So rhyolite melts is a thermodynamic, um, like internally consistent thermodynamic program. Um, and so what I do um, is basically look at, g given an input composition, what minerals are going to be um, in equilibrium with that input composition. When that input composition is a glass, a melt, then I get then the pressure that I get is going to be in equilibrium with the minerals that should be um, that should be in the magma. Believe me, give me a second, give me a second, give me a second. Sorry, that's not super clear. Yeah, that's what I want. Um, so when I have the the melt, um, I want to know what's in equilibrium with this melt. And so using the thermodynamic software, I can see that say plagioclase, quartz, and sanidine are in equilibrium growing from the melt of a given composition that I input. Um, in contrast, so that would be a storage pressure because that's the point where the melt is in equilibrium and is an eruptible magma um, with the crystals. Um, the crystals don't have to be a given composition. You just have to know what they are, um, what phases they are. And so in contrast, if I give an input of a whole rock composition, um, think of this, melt here as being, um, 
as being the whole rock composition. Um, the assumption there is that that melt can be extracted from the mush as a liquid. And so that when that whole rock that was a melt was extracted from the lick from the mush, when it was in contact with the mush, it would have been in equilibrium with the minerals that were in the mush. And so that when it, once it's extracted, assuming, assume, assuming perfect extraction, there's a lot of assumptions going into that, um, but assuming perfect extraction, um, then you should be able to input the whole rock composition into the program rhyolite melts and, under, and get a pressure back, and that pressure should be the extraction pressure. I can point you to some great papers um, about uh, proving that point, but, um, but basically it, the input composition determines whether you're getting a storage pressure or an extraction pressure. Yes, there are a lot more. Yes. How about two more? Oh. Uh, building off of that. Yeah. Um, so on the slide that you had, like, which you recall, it was like, uh, uh, like the rock composition was like something that was like in the middle of Great. Yeah. So the question was um, in the in the slide that I had all of my different tools and what I could and couldn't get out of the different methods. Um, it was uh, it said that the tephra I couldn't get the extraction pressures and so tephra I couldn't I couldn't get any information from extraction and why not? Um, the answer is that for a whole rock composition you need a certain amount of material and so typically you need um, it's actually um, you need a fairly large sort of fist size material. You need technically 10 times the length of the longest crystal in your, in your body to get a homo homogeneous whole rock sample. Um, unfortunately, that's about, that equates to about a fist size piece of pumice. Um, the tephra fall deposit are not fist size, they're this tiny. And so it's really a problem of, um, of, of, of material. Um, I think I could probably, one idea that I had was to um, basically get all the type A pumice together and then create this like weird like tephra snowball and then get a whole rock but I think there would be so many problems with um so many problems with like incorporating pumice of different compositions because I have them right next to each other you can't tell them apart just by looking at them which is a bummer um but um but I think there would be so many problems with that I didn't try I thought it would be messy data at best but I can, but the problem, but the good part is that I can link them with their glass compositions. And so by looking at their glass compositions, I can link what, um, what magma type the tephra are based on um, the same glass compositions as the whole rock. So I can still link them. Yeah. Good question. One more. Chris? Um, you mentioned how one of the questions was like figuring out which flow came first or then. Mm. All of them, and uh, I'm not sure if you answered this already, but my question was like, why couldn't you use um, like rock dating in each of the separate mm. flows to tell which one came first versus like the other method? Yeah, so um, so the question was, why can't I use just dating methods to determine the different ignimbrites and determine the different flows? Um, a couple, couple of reasons why I can't. Um, number one is that um, it's hard to tell what are single pulses. Um, a lot of the places that I collected, even on like the nice ignimbrite land, is currently um, forestry area. They have a lot of pine that they grow there for, for forestry purposes. Um, and so um, it's, it's, it's really diff difficult to tell, like you just kind of like happen upon a road cut. And you're like, I know that I'm in this unit, but I don't know where I am in that unit. And so that would be one challenge is sort of even understanding what subunit you're in in this, in this giant flow, because it's really big, thick flow. That's one problem. Um, number two, which is the bigger issue, is that um, we don't currently, we can't currently say pinpoint exactly the timing or exactly the age of a different flow. So we don't, it would be too close with an error. Um, so they would look like overlapping ages. Even if they were like apart by like 100 years, the error bars would make them look overlapping. Good question. Okay, let's thank Lydia one more time. How about that? Yeah, thank you guys. If you still have questions, come on up and talk to Lydia individually. She's going to lunch over at the yogurt place. She's doing pizza, Cornerstone 430, if you want to join us for that. Thanks. We'll see you next Friday for Jerome Lessman. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Oh, yeah. You're a pro. You turned yourself off already.
Hey, that was really excellent. Oh, thank you so much. I bet yeah, you it was fun. Exhausted. Oh no, yeah, my words per minute is um, <laughs> one time I gave like a three minute thesis, and uh, the professor was like, "Lydia, great three minute thesis. Next time, I'd love to see you breathe." And I was like, "I, I, I just circular <laughs> breathe. It's no problem. I'm, no, I'm really, I'm really crazy. You, you did just great." Can you help? Are you too cool enough for that? Well, you're going to ask a question, Blake. Thank you. You're the new. You're the new Bryce. I'm sorry. You were promoted to president. I can, so we're going to be promoted to I, can, I can feel the attitude from you, Bryce. You're not your president. You're you're way above that. Thank you. All right. Uh, Uh, can you still hear me, first of all? Uh, let me just say a couple final quick comments for you all. Um, thank you for joining us today. Oops, we've got people on screen that don't want to be on screen. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on, Patrick. All right. Five by five, thank you. Okay, so programming note, especially if you were not with us earlier, uh, we have four more of these talks. Uh, this spring. Uh, many of you know Jerome Lessman, and he will be here uh, in the flesh uh, on Friday, April 21st. That's next Friday. I think if a few of you want to come, we got empty seats here. I mean, we, we've developed this enough where we have a, a good thing going. People are attending regularly, but it's not the whole department. We have plenty of majors who choose not to come to these things or whatever. So if you want to come and listen to Jerome in person, I think you should just come. This is room 103 of Discovery Hall, and you know where to park down on 7th Avenue for free. If you don't, there's a video called Walking to CWU Geology, and you walk right by Vindman's Bakery, and you're welcome to come and sit in. You don't have to be bashful about that. And Sky Cooley, some of you know him from videos as well. He'll be here April 28th and so on. So that's the first message, opening this up a little bit to some of you, if you feel like you want to be in Ellensburg. Um, uh, I posted the first of the four downtown lectures. It's on my YouTube channel now. Um, the other three I have, they're finished. Uh, and I'm not sure when I'll post the rest of them. Uh, maybe every one every week or I don't know, every few days, maybe. I don't know. Um, but I also have Geology 351 content. Uh, we had a glorious afternoon yesterday, Thursday afternoon, out at Drumheller Channels. And I had about 15 of my Geology 351 students, and I filmed. And I can now get them on camera. They've signed their little permission slip. And that's all cleared now. So I'm interviewing a few of the kids as we're hiking, a little group session up on top of the columns. Uh, I haven't seen the footage yet, but I think it's I think it's pretty good. And in case it's unclear to you, most of this stuff involving students, involving this room, involving lots of this, is just a new way to market our department. I've said it before, but I, I feel like I want to say it again. In case it's unclear to you, and you have a son or a daughter or a grandson or a granddaughter who's thinking about going to college and potentially taking geology, this is a good place to do that. I mean, why screw around? That's part of what I'm doing here. I'm trying to say this is a this is a, a functioning place. It's more than a functioning place. It's a good place, if you don't mind my saying so. And a Shamlu right here. Yes, sir. Excellent. What's up, YouTube? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's what we're doing here. Uh, in addition, I know some of you are a long, long way away. and You'll never come to Ellensburg, and you'll never send anybody here, and that's totally fine, too. That, 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 that's another goal here. But the most tangible, obvious goal is to showcase who we are in different ways. And so posting some of these Geology 351 things in the field, we have pretty rare stuff here. Oh, I don't need to go on. You, you, already, you already know what I'm up to. Let me say hi to a couple people, and then we'll say goodbye.
for today. Um, there's 331 watching right now. Is that what that means, Papa Gino? I saw your question. I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to ask it. Um, yeah, okay. That's enough. Uh, I'm going to go enjoy lunch with our speaker and a few of the folks. And uh, why not? I don't know if they. Oh, you want to see Bryce the rock licker? Zoom out. Zoom out. So here's some of our best students. Uh, three of them are undergraduates, and Tim Miller is a graduate student. But you know, you know some of those faces from past events, and I will get the camera off them now. How about that? Okay. Thank you. I love you, and goodbye. And there's Jim Gartrell. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, just turn things off.